What's up, running fans, track fans, jumping, throwing fans, all around athletics fans? How's it going? Welcome to Talking in Ovals. I'm Alex Cuesta. As always, uh, today is Monday, October 10th of 2022. The man that you guys all come to listen to is back today, so don't be afraid. You don't have to listen to my voice the whole time. But before we get into anything fun, please give a like, share, follow, subscribe, rate us five stars on Spotify and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth to any of your other trackies or running enthused people. And, uh, you know, let's just have some fun. Find us on the socials, talking and novel. So, Hyatt, you're back. What's up, brother? I am just happy to be back after a week hiatus and ready to do the show, man. We have a... Great guest, one of my good friends, and I'm just excited to talk shop with him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you know, you were saying to me, like, you know, you're going to like Wilfredo. You're going to like him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I figured I would because after I saw his responses, because, you know, I didn't make it no secret. I send out a few questions beforehand to try and, like, structure the show. And he sent me back his responses, and I read them. I'm like, oh, yeah. This is a, this is a guy that I think I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy. But um, quickly before we jump into today today's show, please go back listen to last week's show. Unfortunately, Hyatt wasn't there to be there, but we had Jonathan J. Marcus on. He's one half of Marcus and Magnus on the On Coaching uh, podcast, all about running. He coaches you know elite athletes all over. So please go back and give that a listen. But let's now jump into today's show. Hyatt, this is one of your buddies. You've been saying, let's get him on, and I'm pumped to have him on. He's the head coach for Boys and Girls Cross Country since 2006, head coach for Boys Spring Track since 2005 over at South Brunswick High School. He's been coaching for a totality of 21 years since 2002. Coach Wilfredo Rivera, what's up, Coach? Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, glad to uh, Glad to be here. Uh, excited to talk track you know that's uh, always a fun conversation and uh yeah pleasure to have uh to have me on pleasure certainly yeah and what you know obviously what we're trying to do here is you know we talk track probably all three of us talk track as often as we can to anybody that will listen and you know you get the benefit of being a coach you can talk about it a little more uh me and Hyatt are kind of stuck kind of talking to our significant others and them being like yeah yeah cool yeah bye so it's like we do this it's kind of our way of kind of our therapy of talking about track and we you know we love jumping in with others and you are actually he's our first high school coach isn't he yeah yeah yeah, he's our first coach in the high school, and we kind of want to walk around those ranks too because, I, you know, like I said, I talked to Jonathan Marcus last week, and he's, you know, very much an elite uh, coach. He coaches a lot of elite athletes, high-level, high-octane athletes. Um, and, you know, now it's fun to jump down into the high school level, the not scholastic level, and try and pick your brain because there's obvious differences here. One of the things that I want to start with here is you've been doing this for – two plus decades now when you started 20 years ago uh, what was it like and what has it been changing like what has changed since you started coaching yeah i mean uh, you know i'd say a lot has changed um you know since you know even within the last five years i mean i think one of the major uh major differences is just the amount of information that's out there to uh, kind of be digested. Um, You know, I know when I first started coaching, everyone got the, you know, the Jack Daniels uh, running formula book and, you know, you you were dealing with V dot and, you know, you were just trying to make sense of, okay, well, how do I use this? Um, You know, the lore of running was, you know, a a big, huge scientific, um, you know, uh, (laughs) foreign language book for me. Um, But, you know, uh, the the information really changed. um, And I think you just started to, you know, see kids kind of, you started to see coaching. Um, You know, there was, you had clinics and and you would go and you would hear guys that had their experience talk. But, you know, the internet obviously has been around a long time, but it's just the amount of information that was out there to be digested, not only by the coaches, but the athletes, I felt like it just made every everything just kind of elevate in the sense of the intensity and, um, you know, what it is that people were looking for in the sense of what can they apply, what they can learn, 
Whereas, you know, when I was running and even early on in the coaching, it was just kind of, you know, you pick little things here or there. Um, but now there's just so much good stuff out there um, that you can use. I also feel like um, coaches are a lot more, a lot more amenable to helping other coaches. I remember when I was in high school, there was no way that my high school coach was sharing anything with any other coach. So <laughs> I, I feel like it's definitely more, more of a brethren now or, you know, like, Hey, what's worked for you? Or, you know, you had this guy last year who, who was uh, super elite. I have one now, you know, maybe you can, I can shoot some things off of you and then we can kind of, you know, I don't know. That's I feel when I was coaching, I definitely got a lot from other coaches that I don't feel that my high school coaches would have even talked to other coaches. So I, I think that it's that dynamic has kind of changed some. Yeah. Well, you, you know, and, and to build off that, I think even the athletes themselves just being a lot more aware and connected with one another. Um, you know, I know, you know, wh when I had rivalries uh, with other schools, um, you know, those guys, we just didn't talk. Um, but there was nothing to talk about, right? You know, we're trying to win. We're trying to beat you. And, you know, maybe that came from the coaching dynamic or, or the athletes were driving that. But nowadays, I mean, these kids are friend, uh, friends on the, know. You know, the social media. And, you know, th they're having relationships that go beyond just the competitive side. And I think, you know, that probably branched off a little bit more into coaches going, well, hey, our guys are kind of, maybe doing long runs together, maybe training in the summer. Um, you know, let's talk about wh what you're doing and, and, and maybe that can help them just get better. Um, yeah. And I think with, I think with track in general, sorry, Dave, um, sorry. With track in general too, especially with the distance runners, I feel like that became a thing definitely in my generation. Cause I was definitely a lot more friendly with a lot of the guys I competed with, like on the track, we certainly hated each other. Like the elbows would go and everything within cross country, like the, all the normal stuff, like track's not a physical sport. Yeah. Try doing a distance race. But anyway, um, it definitely started, I think a lot more there because in high school, you certainly found a group of kids in the summer that, we're kind of at your level. And instead of always training with your school, you know, in Ocean County, I was, I knew a bunch of guys and we would definitely meet up at Ocean County Park and go to Monmouth and do certain things and run together. So I think that dynamic <clears throat> certainly changed at some point from, you know, your generation jumping yeah. into mine. Listen, we didn't train with anybody but the kids on my team. Yeah. Luckily, I had great teammates. Um, but it's funny because uh, Will and I, graduated the same year in high school. And for his first two years, we were in, in the same group for cross country. So I knew who he was. I didn't like him. I didn't like Cedar Ridge. I didn't like anything about them because we were, we were always, it was us, North Hunterdon and Cedar Ridge always battling out, you know, for the state championship for group three. And, and then when I got to college, I was like, this guy's super cool. And then we became really good friends, but high school, no way. I, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody. Like my coach didn't, allow it it was a sign of, of weakness do you think uh, for both of you do you think a lot of it changed where sportsmanship started to get promoted much more in sports i think there was a certain time where um there was a lot more preaching of being a good sport and the importance of being a good sport and not just not complaining about losses but kind of respecting your competitors a little more. And I think kind of the respect level kind of branched into more friendships. Uh, do you think that has something to do with that, Wilfredo, where, you know, the sportsmanship maybe pushed a little bit too far and now became friendships and then social media kind of solidified friendships? I, you know, I, I think there's definitely some, some truth to that. You know, I, I hate to keep going back to this kind of knowledge is power, but I think, you know, when you only see someone as just a competitor or an adversary, um, you know, you can't see them outside of that. Yeah. So what winds up happening is now, hey, you get to see them and, you know, maybe what they're posting and they have similar interests outside of running. And then you go, oh, this is kind of a cool guy or we have things in common. So, you know, as Dave said, when we got to college, well, well now we're on the same team. So even though we had different philosophies perhaps coming in, well, we have some common ground. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think everyone, at least when, you know, in, in the uh, mid 90s, you know, we used to have to wait for information at the end of the season. Right. We'd have to wait for Ed Grant to put out, uh, you know, one of his annuals or we'd have to find out about this blonde haired kid from California, Michael Stember, running, 
you know, times and then going, well, who's this guy? And then once you actually got to start seeing them and you started going to these national meets and, okay, well, he's just a normal kid. Uh, I feel like it just kind of broke the the barrier of, of mystique and, you know, maybe some of that um, that hate, if you will. And then you go, okay, well, they're just like me. They're trying to win. And you, you get a, a sense of respect, right? That whole iron sharpens iron. So I'm only as good because you're doing what you're doing and I want to be as good as you. But before that, you were just a name. Now I have a face. Now I have a personality. Now, I guess for the kids, not that I'm using that, but now I have social media to see what they're about besides just, you know, running or or competing against me on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I'm going to do something a little off topic so we could jump back in because it jumped into my head. And I need to ask you guys, especially being longtime coaches, um, uh, someone that I was talking to, another runner, took a little bit of um, uh, an issue with something that Marcus put out saying that he was wrong. And it had to do with breathing. Um, Basically that learning how to breathe correctly, breathing in your nose, out your mouth when running. And he was like, no, that's been scientifically proven wrong. That oral breathing actually brings in more blah, blah, blah. What do you guys, what's your experience as runners and as coaches? Do you recommend still doing in your nose, out your mouth? Um, are you more of if you're orally breathing only, that's okay. Um, what do you guys think there? My whole thing was, you know, to any athlete, as long as you're breathing, I don't really care how it gets done. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I never really, like, broke it down into, you know, I guess, you know, in high school, you're worrying about so, so many other components, you know, I, I guess at that elite level it's a lot easier to focus on the those smaller things but you know as a high school middle school coach you know there's so many other things i never really paid attention to how my athlete was breathing i mean if it was obvious i guess that that i mean i always went i guess i don't, I don't even know i just ran <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, well uh, my, my take on the, uh, on the breathing, it's almost kind of like placebo effect. You know, whatever you feel is working for you, keep doing. But, you know, I always try to use, uh, you know, the breathing and breathing patterns in the sense of um, using it as a cue to just kind of bring more comfort to the run, right? So, you know, I, I talk about, hey, if you run by someone and, and they're breathing heavy, you know, that might be a sign that, you know, they're laboring, right? So maybe you pull a surge and, and vice versa. Hey, listen, if, if some guys are coming up or, or some girls are coming up alongside you and you're <sighs> sucking wind, that, that's going to give them maybe some confidence in the moment to go, you know what, let me pull a surge. Let, let, let me pull a surge up this hill. So just kind of be aware of how your breathing might uh, present you to your competition and to yourself, Right. And then, of course, there's always the, oh, I have a stitch, you know, how, how you work out uh, cramps and stitches with breathing. And, you know, what I was always taught is, hey, if you got a cramp on your right side, every other step with your left, breathe out, right? Because you got some air trapped in your diaphragm. So push it out, work it out yeah. um, and practice that in practice, because if it happens in a race, you, you don't want to slow down. You don't want to drop out. So, you know, so to me, that's where the breathing comes in. But you know, my logic tells me the more air you're going to, uh, you know, the more oxygen you can take in, the better. So, you know, I'm always a big fan of, hey, if you know, you got to use your mouth because I've had kids who, you know, they run like, you know, their their mouths are shut tight. And I'm like, that doesn't look comfortable. And you can only get so much air through your nose. So, you know, kind of be a mouth breather, if you will. Um, and, you know, do what you can to get what you need. Yeah, I was always an in your nose, out your mouth guy. I don't know why. I was always taught that that was kind of the rhythm of running. But then again, who knows? But some advice for any young runners that have never run indoor before, don't worry about breathing in indoor. Because if you really are trying to breathe, it's going to fail. Indoor, it sucks to breathe. So if you're running indoor track for the first time, if that's your focus on breathing, you're going to have dry mouth really quick. It happens on the first lap if you're a distance runner. So that was kind of a social media thing that I was talking about there. I want to transfer over there because I mentioned social media a few times. How has that come into coaching um, where a lot of athletes are, you know, I can imagine, especially some of the smart ones that really love the sport that are, you know, on flow track and on things. Do you have a lot of athletes coming to you saying, hey, coach, I saw this. Hey, coach, I saw that. Can we try this, coach? I, You know, I this athlete posted this up. Like, what has your experience been with 
the social media burst and influencers and big time runners and everyone posting their workouts and things like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, my take is, like I said, it's, it's like with everything, um, you know, uh, variety can be good, but it's got to come in moderation. So, you know, what works for someone may not necessarily work for you. Um, you know, I always like students of the sport, you know, uh, I'm a big track nut myself. So when kids are nutty about track, you know, I never want to, I never want to stop that. Right. I never want to kind of contain it. But, you know, what I always tell kids is, look, there's a bunch of ways to get to where you might want to be. And not one way is the only way, um, you know, so, you know, if they come in and say, hey, coach, well, what do you think about this? You know, we can talk about it. And I'll say, yeah, you know, I understand that or I don't understand much about that. <laughs> but here's why I won't use it or here's why it's not a bad idea. So, you know, I kind of take it in stride because, you know, it's inevitable. Um, you know, kids have a they have a lot of their own opinions and they're real quick to jump on maybe a, a trend or a fad or something that they think is working. But, you know, my, my arguments always listen. It's about consistency. So if we've been doing it and it's been working, we can stay that doesn't mean we, we, we can't alter it. But we're not going to try something new and funky um, and think that it's going to lead to something right away. You know, slow and steady gets it, you know, done. At least that's been my take with it. Yeah. So I wanted to just uh, ask you something that we've talked about a few times on this podcast. You've been involved in the uh, track and field cross country in the state of New Jersey for what, probably since 1992, freshman year of yeah, freshman year, awesome. Cedar Ridge, yeah. And every year since that time, there's always been a meet of champions at the end of the season to determine the best of the best. What is your take on this, on the NJSIA wanting to get rid of the meet of champs? I mean, we have our thoughts. I think it's absolutely ludicrous and insane. But I'm just wondering, you know, from an active coach's perspective, what's your uh, opinion on that? Well, well, I mean, Media Champs is happening. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the version of it has changed a bit for this season. Um, you know, uh, how I feel about it is, you know, it seems like since COVID, a lot of, a lot of motivation in a lot of different areas has been to um, get down to uh, kind of an approach that fits all, right? So, all right, well, we're not going to have um, tournament of champions for basketball and other sports. So because we're not doing that for other sports, we want to end, you know, what would be our equivalent of the tournament of champions, if you will, the media champions, because fair is fair. Now, you know, for example, when COVID hit in my particular conference, which is uh, the GMC um, you know, I thought that would have been a great time to really highlight and lean into cross country because it was one of the sports that you can actually do yeah. outside. Um, and and really for this once in a lifetime, you know, knock on wood type of pandemic situation, why not give this sport the spotlight because it was available to mm -hmm. me? But instead, my conference said, since we're not having any conference championships for any sports, we didn't have a conference championship for cross country. And I just thought that was like a really lost opportunity within our conference. I mean, other conferences, you know, uh, they, they did it the right way, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, going back to the meet of champs, you know, I get that there's always, you know, ways to try to make things better. But you know, it's the old adage, you don't want to cut off your nose to spite your face. And because our sport is unique and because it can, you know, break down to one single championship, the other sports have tournaments, right? Mm -hmm. They have brackets. This is a one day, one shot opportunity to define the best of the best. Yep. You, you don't lose that opportunity if you don't have to. Um, and, you know, uh, it seems like cooler heads prevailed and, and we were able to maintain it as best as we could. Um, so, you know, the qualifying format changed a bit. I don't want to get into the weeds with the details, but 
they they will be crowning a team championship um, for me to champions and, you know, an individual winner. Um, and, you know, for me, given that something had to give um, because the decision makers wanted to tighten it up a bit, um, it was uh, better better to have the version that we have than to have lost it in totality. So, so being an active uh, coach, did they give you a particular reason as to why this is something they want to do? Because like, as I look at it from the outside, looking in the media champs, you know, is not only an opportunity to win it all and to compete against the best of the best, but for these juniors, especially, and even some seniors that haven't made decisions yet, that's a big deal. If you race and compete well in the New Jersey cross country meet of champions, that's a really big deal and something that you could show prospective coaches like, hey, I competed well against the best in New Jersey who are, hey, I was a top five scorer on a team that won the meet of champions championship. So uh, what is kind of, you know, their reasoning for why they want to do this to a sport where it's kind of like, yeah, like you said, it's, we don't go through a tournament. We don't go through the grueling type of thing that a lot of them do. It's one shot, one deal, perform your best, win it all, or, you know, go home and just be happy you got here. So what, what did they give you on that? I mean, really it was, um, again, initially when they said they were making the decision to get rid of the, uh, tournament of champions for basketball. And I believe, um, uh, you know, the softball or some of the other sports, um, their, their their initial take was that Mita Champions was not going to be, uh, or cross country was not going to be impacted by this decision. And and, and girls lacrosse and, and all the other sports, they had the Tournament of Champions. And their argument was that the Tournament of Champions were very lopsided. What was happening was the same teams were winning. Um, you were putting, uh, you know, a group uh, for school against a group two or whatever it was. And these were very lopsided games, especially in basketball. Um, and, you know, what was kind of the point? Um, you know, you had the same winners. Um, it wasn't really this great dynamic within the tournament. But again, under the idea that cross country was going to be touched. And then when cross country was going to be touched and there was going to be no team championship, they were basically arguing that they were going to make the meet of champions a real highlight to your point, actually for individuals, they wanted to make it more of an individual event, but you know, uh, obviously cross country coaches argued you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the individual aspect because that was already there, yeah. mm -hmm. but to take the team it, it, again, because it wasn't going to require anything. You weren't going to have to have multiple days, yeah. multiple races, it was a one day thing in which the individuals could fall in line with the team component. Um, so I, I think a lot of it was just trying to streamline some of the tournaments. And then they said, well, let's streamline this. And, you know, our argument was kind of, if it's not broken, uh, why are you trying to fix something that doesn't need it? But, you know, you, you, something had to, to meet in the middle and then ultimately you know, it got down to, well, 14 teams are going to qualify for the meet of champions, whereas the old format, it would have been 20. What um, is the, uh, so, like, what is the qualification based on? Because I feel like it could hurt the smaller schools and definitely have an advantage for the larger schools. Um, and and, and it, it will. It will impact the smaller schools. Um, and, you know, that's um, that's something that's kind of a, a catch 22, right? You don't want to see anyone excluded. However, you know, playing devil's advocate, everyone still has their group meet, right? So yeah. those small schools are still competing for their group one title. The parochial bees are still competing for that title. Um, and those group winners will still be going to the meet of champs. It's just the wild cards. So, uh, so I think, believe the format is that the top six, uh, the group winners will be in, and then eight wild cards once they merge all of those group results um, into kind of a, you know, I guess a virtual um, meet. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see who the, the eight additional wild cards to get that 14. And that's all based on team average at, in the group meet. Yeah. That day. And, you know, it's, it's as good as it gets because, you know, you could, you know, is it possible that the early races are run in perfect conditions and some tornado rolls in? Yeah. I mean, you're always going to run that risk, but, um, 
you know, at the end of the day, you're probably going to see the majority of the wild cards come from the the, the bigger groups, um, well, the competitive groups that are deeper, because the races will be a lot more competitive in the in the middle and the the meat of it of it all. I feel like in cross country, though, out of a lot of other sports, the small schools do get a more better opportunity because to have a group of five run really fast, even at a small school, there's like for as opposed to other sports, there's still a really good opportunity of that happening in XC. So you can have, like you know, a good small school that just has a really good running culture and they consistently kind of bring it, even if they're not winning. So I think that there's a good chance there. And I want to dive back in a little more into the coaching side of it. Because, you know, we only have you here for a set amount of time and I really want to pick your brain because so far your brain is working pretty well. I'm liking it right now. So uh, <laughs> so I want to talk about kind of um, you mentioned kind of adjusting before, you know, when we were talking about other athletes bringing in their kind of ideas from social media and things like that. Talk about adjusting because you're the cross country coach for both men and women. So uh, kind of talk about your adjustment when you're dealing with different athletes, their characteristics, whether it's, you know, the, you know, their sex, how good they are, um, how driven they are, different cultures, different people. Like, how is it? Do you find that, you know, you mentioned everyone has a little bit of a different style. So what is your coaching style as, you know, with each individual athlete? Do you kind of do more blanket with cross country? Does that change coming into track? Um, what do you, what's your approach there? Okay. So, uh, you know, my feeling with uh, the, the, the beauty of cross country is that the end game is the same for everyone, right? So regardless if you're a freshman, uh, you know, a junior varsity level runner, varsity runner, boy, girl, we're all trying to get ready for the 5k. Um, and we're all trying to get ready, at least in our conference to, to, to run fast at Thompson park, because that's where our county meet is. That's where our sectional is, um, you know, and then obviously home Del park is where the groups and media champs, but you mm -hmm. know, now we're talking varsity level. Yeah. So, so what I've always felt with cross is I love cross because we're all training for the same thing track, you know, it gets a little hard and it's a little bit more nuanced because now you got your hurdlers, you got your sprinters, you got your weight guys, you got your, you know, your vaulters, um, you got your long jumpers who might sprint and hurdle or whatever the case might be. So you got a lot of different, um, you know, at least how we talk about it is we have our units right in track, whereas cross country, we're all getting ready for the same thing. Now, the way I try to think about training is experience matters right you gotta you gotta know what you're getting into and there's a consistency cross country for me is the foundation that's what we build the house on um but it doesn't mean that everyone stays to you know doesn't mean they're going to winter um track it doesn't mean indoor track doesn't mean they're doing spring but if you're going to do cross you know our season starts in the summer you know, by the time we get to day one of school, oh, yeah. half of our season is done. And that's the that's hard for a lot of kids to buy into and to and to really embrace. And, you know, obviously we want everyone competing at the best level. But, you know, what what we do is, you know, my argument is we don't we don't cut kids. Uh, they cut themselves um, because if they can't commit to the process, what happens is they're going to get hurt. Yep. And as a coach trying to be responsible, I can't ignore the fact that you didn't do the work that was required for half the season because you're going to come in, you're going to try to do too much too fast, and then you're going to get hurt. And then that's my problem anyway. Right. So, um, so motivation levels are all different. Um, you know, I'm, I'm usually a little bit more lenient and understanding when they're young because, you know, they may not know. They might come from a middle school where, you know, it, they're canceling practice when it rains. And I'm not judging that middle school. I don't know that life. But, um, you know, we don't cancel practice because it rains because we have to race in it. So, yeah, yeah. you know, so sometimes there's some adjustment in getting them to understand what we're about. Um, do, do I think we lose kids because, you know, it's a, you know, and I put it, it's a little too serious at the high school. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I don't hide behind that. We're serious because like I said, from as, uh, as trying to be a responsible coach, 
I have to have you ready and I need you to feel confident that you're ready. Now, in regards to boys and girls, um, you know, I treat them the same. We have a lot of groups that are co-mingled. Um, you know, I would love to have groups that are just girls working together because they're going to have to race together. Um, but for example, this year, I have a really small girls team. It's the smallest team I've had in since I've been here. We have 11 girls, which is, wow. you know, I mean, there's a, another conversation in regards to why I think that's happened. But, um, you know, but I have, you know, a girl who just ran 1925 and she's training with a group of boys when she works out. But some of her distance runs she does with some of her female counterparts only because you want to build the culture with their teammates that they're going to race with. But at the same time, you want to get the most out of that, that runner, um, regardless of gender. And, and because we go to all the meets and because I'm the head coach for both, you know, I have to deal with both. Um, so I, I'm always going to approach the training, uh, the, the same way. Um, you know, I'm a father, I have three daughters. So since, you know, since I've had my kids, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've learned that, you know, you have to know your clientele and you can't talk to everyone the same way. And sometimes you have to be a little softer and a little bit more understanding. So, you know, those are little kind of nuanced things that I have learned along the way. Um, because, you know, having been coached by male coaches and been in a all male program all the time, you know, some of that, uh, you know, bring bring the intensity wasn't really working and it was kind of backfiring. And at the end of the day, I want them to get out of it what I'm trying to get them to get out of it. And if you don't have that line of communication um, working, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you say, what you do. It's, it's just not going to it's not going to get it's not going to get across. I want to say um, because. I remember, obviously, you and I were in, in college together, and I knew that I wanted to be a coach when I got out of college. I remember talking to you in college, and you had zero interest in coaching. <laughs> like It was something that was not, not on your radar at all. So just like tell us what changed that viewpoint for you, and also what was it like going back to coach in the same conference um, against the your old – coaches in, in, in high school and had to go up against those guys who helped mentor you as a person and as a coach. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're hundred percent right. Um, you know, I, I didn't have any interest in coaching. I, I never even thought about uh, myself as a coach, um, you know, uh, now in retrospect, you know, teaching, um, being a parent, being a friend, you know, you're always coaching people up. People are coaching you up. Um, you know, it might be a little bit more, you know, serious things in life than it is necessarily the X's and O's of, of trying to run a certain time or do a certain thing. Um, but the, the long and short of it was um, Brian Jost, um, who was, um, you know, started the girls program at South Brunswick. He was the boys and girls cross country coach. He was a coach that was coaching when I was in high school. Um, he approached me um, at the end of my first year of teaching. And he said, hey, listen, you know, hey, Will, you know, good to see you. Um, you know, I have a coaching position open. You know, I would love to have you come on. You were at a great program at Old Bridge. You ran at Rutgers. And the fact that he took the time to come seek me out and ask if I was interested in coaching, um, I, I almost I, I agreed to do it almost just out of respect. Um, you know, for this, this great guy, this great coach who felt that I could add something to his program. Um, and that was it. He, you know, he, he basically said, I'd love for you to, and I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and you know, th it was just, uh, like I said, it, it was really just, uh, out of respect that he even took the time to consider it. And then, you know, before you know it, you know, here I am, <laughs> you know, 20 plus years later, but that's how it started. Um, and, you know, in regards to coaching against, um, you know, my high school coaches, um, that was really hard in the beginning uh, because, you know, as the competitor, I, 
you know, I wanted to beat them. <laughs> yeah. and, and a lot of the, um, you know, South Brunswick kids would say, oh, you ran at Old Bridge, you know, like, what did they do? You know, like, and, and I laughed and I said, what do you mean? What did they do? And they're like, well, why are they so good? Why do they always win? And I go, guys, like, they just work hard and they just expect to win because they work hard and there's a culture there and there's nothing special in the water. Like I went there, like there's no secrets. It's just hard work. And, you know, and to see that it was, you know, kind of like, uh, Oh, all right. Well, I guess people might see things about Obridge that I just took for granted because I was in it. But then once I got to be a Viking, like I said, like, you know, I love my coaches, you know, uh, Coach, Coach, Coach Kabauer, or Coach Campbell. I mean, those guys were, you know, as you alluded to, Dave. Like, you know, those guys helped me become the person that I, you know, I am and who I wanted to be. Though I didn't want to coach, and so I wanted to beat them. And you know, a bunch of years uh, we were not beating them. We were finishing second, but we were making progress. And you know, and then I remember when we finally got over the hump in cross um, and in track. It, you know, it was a great feeling, but I think there was also that sense of, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but I think there was that sense of pride, if you will, because they knew that they had created, um, you know, created a monster, if you will, because of their their thing. And, you know, it's funny because as I've been here and have had other athletes come and coach with me, Look, there's going to be coaches that make a lot of great athletes, you know, that run fast times. But I feel like one of the things that really shows the impact of a coach is the coaches they make, because that's going to have so much value year in, year out because of the athletes that that one athlete and coach has helped, you know, uh, develop. Um, So it's kind of that pay it forward that just keeps multiplying. So, you know, to me, that's part of their legacy is that anything that I, I have done and, and, and will do for any of my athletes uh, started with those guys. And that's pretty powerful, uh, at least in, in my opinion. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I'm like Dave, I always wanted to be a coach. Like that was one thing I knew once I was done competing, I was interested in coaching and, you know, I pursued it as, much as possible. And right now I'm coaching my daughter's uh, U5 soccer team. So, you know, I'm still doing it, man. But, um, yeah, yeah. you know, one of the coolest things for me was, and once I entered into coaching and I started doing it, I feel like the title of coach and being known as coach is something akin to like when people call like other people doctor and things like that. Like it really does become something awesome. And the relationships you make with athletes, and then when you see them years down the road, and you talk to them and they still have that respect level for you as coach. Like for something, for me, it was just awesome to be able to have those types of relationships. And the title of coach to me is just possibly one of the coolest titles I think anybody can have. And I think Dave agrees with me. So you didn't want to be a coach. So when did it kind of click for you that, okay, this is actually pretty cool. Like I'm actually enjoying this i'm enjoying the camaraderie i'm enjoying the friendship i'm building with you know seniors that are leaving and then they come back and i'm still coach i'm not mr rivera anymore like no i'm forever in their eyes coach like when did that click for you that you know this this is pretty cool and i can do this for a long time i guess uh you know after the first couple years of doing it and because it was kind of really intimidating at first you know because now you're responsible for this whole group and you're going like listen i knew what to do when someone (laughs) told me to do it but i don't necessarily know what to tell you to do um so uh, you know there was a lot of a learning curve i mean and i think any good coach after a while you know you go back and go man if i knew then what i know now Like I could have helped that kid be so much better. I could have made better decisions. So I'd say maybe, you know, the first, the first, really all those years that I was an assistant, those first four or five years um, when I was an assistant for cross, because I was, I actually became a head coach for track before the cross country team. And then just that um, Brian, Brian Joe's coach Joe's when he was retiring and he was like, Hey, you can do this. 
I guess that was kind of really the stamp of like, all right, this guy, like I said, this guy's the the reason there's even a girls cross country program. Yeah. He's been the only girls cross country coach until it got handed off to me, if you will. And I'm going, okay, well, he's the one who came and sought me out and said, Hey, I, you know, I think you can help us and then feel comfortable enough to retire and go, this guy's going to do all right. Or at least, you know, this guy's going to do well enough, but at the end of the day, I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> I, I think that might have been where I said, okay, people are seeing it. And then, you know, once you started getting results and, you know, we started to be, um, you know, somewhat successful um, uh, while I was head coach, you know, because they had their own success prior to, uh, I think that's when it started to go, okay, you know, maybe I can do this. Um, and, you know, anytime athletes come back and they go, hey, coach, like I missed this or I remember that or, you know, that always just kind of brings a good feeling because you feel like, you know, not everyone's going to go and run in college. Not everyone's going to go be a coach. But when they come back and you see the maturity, you know, it makes it all worthwhile. Certainly. So any coach who's coached high school, especially a distance coach, knows that um, – it can be a long, grueling year if you coach cross country, winter track, spring track, especially the two track seasons because those meets tend to go on for, you know, forever. For, yeah, pretty much. Um, so you, you were doing that, and then you had a family, um, and you and I have talked uh, about this where you actually took off a few seasons here and, and there because maybe. You, you felt that it was taken away from some of your time at home. So what was it like to, to have to make that choice? And was it an easy choice? Was it a hard choice? Yeah. So, so my history was I had done 13 years um, of uh, cross winter and spring. So, you know, 39 seasons. And then I, I came back for cross and that was the 40th season. And then I took off winter and honestly, what made it very easy was that, you know, one of my assistant coaches in cross, you know, um, Matt Randall, you know, who was a, an alumni of South Brunswick, um, you know, he was there to to kind of take my position in winter. And because, you know, we work together in the fall and like I said, cross country is the foundation it was really easy to kind of hand it off the same way it was handed off to me knowing, Hey, this guy knows, he knows what he's doing. Um, it's going to give him his opportunity to kind of, you know, guide the ship, um, if you will, for the distance runners. Um, so it made it easy to leave because I knew when I came back in spring, you know, these kids were going to be where they should be because our coaching philosophies were aligned and whatnot. Um, it also made it easy because, you know, what was happening for me personally, and, and this is when I knew I had to give up winter just for myself. You know, winter was always a nice season because I was an assistant and I didn't have to do all the head coach uh, paperwork and all the other things mm -hmm. that come with being a head coach that have nothing to do with the training. Yeah. Um, and then I, I came into spring and, and we had this great run of like, we were, you know, we were having great seasons, you know, all year and it was just high intensity nonstop. You know, we got to win this. How are we going to get ready for that? That I went into spring burnt out before it even started. I was just, I was just toast. And I was like, I can't do this because now I, I'm, you know, I'm the captain, if you will, uh, of the ship. And I don't even want to be here right now because I'm just toast. Um, so that was a sign for me personally. And then obviously at home, you know, the, the captain at home is, is, is my wife, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and she was dealing with, you know, Sonia, she was dealing with all of the responsibilities and just being able to say, Hey, like, I think everything's kind of lining up to not do this. And, you know, she said, you can do it if you need to, because, you know, that's the, the type of woman she is. And just being able to be there, whether it's to take this one to, to dance or it just, you know, again, it reminded me about my responsibilities at home and that felt good too. And, and that's something that I think as, as, as all coaches that have families, you know, I'd let my, my athletes know, you know, like, Hey, listen, man, like 
I love working with you guys, but while I'm here with you, like for example, this Wednesday, Hey, I'm here with you. We have our divisional race. You know, some of you are going to be working out. I'm missing my daughter's race. And I go, and that's fine because I signed up for this, but so did you, right? So, Hey, let's not talk about, Oh, I have this club or I have to go here or have to do this. Hey, we all have a lot to do, but we sign up for things and, and we got to, you know, we got to be held accountable for what we commit to. So, you know, I think, you know, I mean, I know this is a little off topic, but I think in some ways that's one of those things that um, has been very important in in taking seasons off because there was some guilt, right? Like, hey, man, I'm leaving these kids. It's their senior year. I've been coaching them. You know, this is when they want to hit these goals. But knowing that you can hand it off to someone that knows what they're doing and at the same time, you know, um, lighten the load at home and, you know, take a breather so I can recharge for spring. You know, that's been awesome. Now saying all that, you know, I did get pulled in like, uh, <laughs> le- like, like, uh, like Michael Corleone, you know, <laughs> I try to go out and they pull me back in and I did get pulled in last winter because they needed someone. Um, and you know, it was great to be back because it was, you know, I hadn't done it in like five, six years and, Anyway, so that, you know, so I did get pulled back last winter um, and, you know, that was nice. Um, but, you know, winter's off is um, yeah. is good for the soul. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah, I, I can't blame you at all. <laughs> I definitely think, you know, the, the fact that you have someone that, that you trust is huge because I know like it's very hard to leave something that you have such pride in to a person that you're not sure if they can actually get the job done. So I, I think that was a, a very very valid point. And that had to be a little nostalgic for you to be able to hand off a program that you probably had pride in and that you probably really worked to build up. And now you're doing essentially what was, like you said, what was done for you. Like you handed a program to another, you know, young coach that now can kind of spread their wings and fly, which I think, you know, had to be a little nostalgic for you there. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, I I feel like, um, you know, and, you know, just speaking about the coaching, the coaching racket, um, You know, a lot of coaches don't last long anymore. You know, those old school coaches that are coaching 30, 40 years, um, you know, and I say that as someone who's been at it, you know, 20 plus, but (laughs) um, it's kind of like a dying breed. And I think when you're doing it right, um, it's, it, it almost has to be that way because you put a lot into it, but having kids have experience with other coaches, you know, that's why when, when, when I have athletes and they do other sports, um, you know, uh, when I was a younger coach, I used to hate that stuff. What? <laughs> You're going to go do this? What are you talking about? That makes no sense. But I from a football. life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> but from a life experience point, you know, sometimes just learning to see someone else have an impact, see how they coach the kid up um, can be very powerful for those kids. And it could be a good break because we know that you know, when it's crawl, it's summer, it's fall, it's winter, it's spring, and it's the same kids and the same coaching, you know, sometimes the, the message gets a little stale and it gets a little old. So bringing in some young coaches, bringing in people that have that fire that you may not have, um, you know, you like to see it at the same time. You hate to see those experienced coaches go, but, the, you know, the coaching racket is – It's a grind, man. So you're seeing more and more coaches, uh, the lifespan, if you will, shorten. Um, And and that is a little tough for programs to keep the continuity. Um, That's what we kind of been blessed with at South Brunswick is that we've had coaching stats that have been pretty consistent. And I think that leads to consistent results. And, um, you know, the culture, the culture stays, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I love that you call it a coaching racket. I think that's absolutely fantastic and a great way to describe what it is. Uh, but I have to ask you, because this is going to get a little bit deep, um, but uh, mental health has been a huge thing for young kids lately. And I have my opinions on why and what and everything, but that's neither here nor there. But you're a coach now, again, like we've, you know, we met you a few times, two decades plus. How has the athlete changed that you have coached? Because I feel like they're different mentally and, you know, cross country, especially and distance runners that 
is something that I think obviously you have some people that have a mentability, but in order to be a good XC runner, you have to be 80% mentally tough and 20% talented. I think that might be shortchanging the mental toughness aspect of being a skilled runner. Um, so what have you seen with the athlete and the changes over the last 20 years and how has that affected you and your coaching style? Wow. Okay. Yeah, um, a little bit deep, a little loaded. Yeah, I'm no, sorry, no, but I had to no, drop no. it in there. <laughs> no, it's it, it, it's it's a great question. It's a great topic because you know I've lost um I've lost many athletes over the the last couple of years to what I would you know I I do think there was a COVID effect, um and and, and what I mean by that is, <laughs> you know I think COVID has killed many athletic careers and what i mean especially scholastic careers because what happened is when you're in a routine and you know it and again this is just my opinion and then that routine's taken away listen something fills the void and that something isn't always good yeah right so what happens is out of sight out of mind and now kids are trying to get back into a fold that they either never really knew or they knew, but it's not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that type of change and shift was really demoralizing. So, uh, you know, th this kind of fits in with it. So it's a very kind of interesting for me. So, so here's what happened, right? Uh, 2020, uh, that spring, I had the best team I was ever going to have on paper. I mean, we were dynamic. We had dynamic pieces. They had crushed all indoors. They had won everything indoors with the exception of state relays. They won the section. They won the county. They won group four. We were, we were going to be adding that, and we were going to be adding other kids in like events that they didn't have indoors. Long jumpers, triple jumpers, discus throwers, jab throwers. We were loaded. Now, we all know what happened 2020. It got canceled. Yep. So when we, when we, so we had spring track practice for two days. And, you know, our school sent us away for two weeks. And, you know, as the captain of, of the ship, if you will, and I was all off all winter, I was ready for spring. <laughs> I had to keep these kids motivated, right? So what did we do, right? We get the Google Classroom set up. We, you know, Oh, we're out for two weeks. Guys, you got to stay training, stay focused. Don't lose any time. We'll be back in two weeks, right? Okay, no, guys, it's going to be two more weeks. All right, guys, it's going to be two more weeks. We got to stay training. When we come back, it's going to be this race. You know, don't lose focus. And what happened during that time for myself is I started getting imposter syndrome, right? I'm going, I'm over here telling them they have to stay motivated. They have to do this. And I'm sitting home. We have no way to teach. I'm posting, you know, online lessons that are just virtual. Kids have to do it by midnight. Yeah. And I'm going, what am I doing here? And that's when I started running. Because I started feeling like, you know, hey, you, it was real cool when it was like, do as I say, not as I do. But now I have the time and I'm trying to preach to a crowd to make, be motivated. And I'm knowing deep, deep down this is over. This season is not happening. Yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't say it. Right. So I feel like some of those kids, when we were in a regular thing, it was real easy to walk out of the school, go to practice and be an athlete. But now they were forced to, to maybe, you know, the noise got real quiet. They had to look at themselves and they had to assess, was this worth it? And then they never came back to it. And their mental health, because again, I'm a big fan, you know, obviously I know Dave through athletics. I know a lot of people, a lot of my great friends were through competition, teammates. So I know the power of team. And I think kids got out of it and they never came back into it. And I feel like they lost out. And I feel that's part of why their mental health is not as strong or as consistent as it could have been because they got, it got quiet. And now they had to hear things that maybe track was distracting them from. And for some people, it, it could have been the best thing that they needed because maybe they were always on the edge and they didn't know. But that's been the hardest thing. And now that we're kind of back more normal, I mean, I've had a lot of kids say, hey, you know, 
I can't do this anymore. And I always say, look, I wish you the best of luck. I never press a kid to to stay where they feel they can't. But I feel like if if they stood, they might have found, you know, the magic that they kind of remember that got lost. And, you know, that's unfortunate. And, you know, we always fight the good fight. And and like I said, you know, you want to have kids be a part of something because when you have purpose um, and and I think that purpose helps you feel um, like you belong. And I think yeah. a lot of the mental health is kids don't know what lane they're supposed to be in and they're having a tough time falling into to a lane again. I think that's interesting because I guess like here's like the difference between like an old school coach and kind of like the newer generations, right? Because, you know, you're talking about 30, 40, 50 year head coaches. And I feel like their approach to something like this wouldn't have been as nice as you were where a kid would come and say, I can't do this. And, you know, those coaches would have turned around and said, well, you're ruining your future. You need to stick this out. And that was something definitely that I think you guys probably were coached as with some of your coaches a little more Absolutely. tough as nails. It's like, what, you want to quit on your team? You're going to quit on your teammates? You're not Absolutely. only doing this, you're ruining this and that. Where, uh, you know, I, I guess that there's good and bad approaches to both. I'm not saying your approach is wrong at all, but I feel like your approach kind of is definitely molded more towards the current athlete because I don't think the current athlete, athlete would respond well to that. I think that they would kind of, shut down even more and close off any relationship with you at all possible. So I don't know. I don't envy your position right now, having to come back and deal with, you know, a lot of these kids coming off of COVID and being stuck at home for two years and things like that. But I just thought it was kind of interesting to like, definitely juxtapose the old school mentality versus kind of more of a newer mentality in coaching. Yeah. And, and listen, my tendency is, (laughs) at times is to be a little bit more old school and tough, but what I found, and, and, you know, of course, I'm sure some of these kids will be like, no way, because, you know, I I hold the standard in saying, look, we're not a club, we're a team. And that requires you to be here. It requires you to be accountable and responsible and to communicate. Um, And, you know, I think kids speaking about, you know, over-reliance on technology I think kids have really lost the ability to communicate verbally face to face. You know, they want to send an email, they want to send an email after the fact. Um, But what I've, I've found when a kid wants to quit, they've already made that decision. Yeah. So, so any, any convincing them inevitably, they're going to let, they're going to let you down because they're already checked out. So I don't want to say addition by subtraction because it just sounds negative. Yeah. But the idea is when they've already made that decision, it's already done. So all I tell them is, hey, look, you know, I don't like, you know, decisions that you just do uh, just like this. I go, OK, this is what you're thinking. Here's here's where I'm at with it. Like, you know, if you need a break and you want to come back and think like, you know, take a couple days. No, coach, I thought about it. OK. We shake hands, but, but I I will tell you what still will still get under my skin (laughs) is a lot of these kids will quit over email. They won't come talk to you. Yeah, no, they won't return the uniform. So you, now you got to go hunt them down for it. And, you know, everyone does what they need to do for themselves. But I do think, Hey, when we've put time into each other, you know, if you're going to break up with us, you know, tell me to the face, because like I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to scream about it. It's just, okay. You know, thank you for coming to talk. I wish you the best. And you know, uh, that's that. And, and, and there is some business aspect to it because I got a hundred other kids I have to worry about. Yeah. So, you know, like if you're, if you can't be here, uh, you know, I hope you find what it is that you need, wherever it might be, but you you know, now I have to pivot and, and now I'm focusing on the kids that are here. So I tell my team that all the time. I can't worry about who's not here. I have to worry about who's here. I don't worry about who graduated and, oh, wouldn't it be great if they were still here? Yeah, maybe, but <laughs> they're not. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The reality says they're gone. And, or, and- or worry about, you know, this kid on this other team ran this time or that like 
Who yeah. cares? Who cares about them? So we're, you know, we're at a point, we're almost at an hour now, Dave. Um, do you have anything else that you want to talk to? Because I know we haven't gotten to some things that we wanted to talk about. And, you know, coach, love to have you back on when spring is done and we can kind of put a bow on and wrap up to, you know, how you felt about the season and anything else that's gone on throughout the season. Maybe talk about kind of the meet of champs changes and what you thought about them and those types of things. But I'd love to have you back on. But Dave, anything else that you have for him before we kind of close out here. I just want to let Will know that uh, Darren Waller has done nothing so far in this season. So, it's <laughs> well, 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 D- D- Darren Waller uh, apparently <laughs> aggravated his hamstring, so that's pretty oh. much on par with uh, you and I are still process in bottom training. feeders uh, this year in our league because we don't have any quarterbacks. <laughs> no, no. I just want to uh, you know thank Will. I- I've been friends with him for for years. You know, I've I've had some. Uh, struggles in my life and he was always a, a person that that I could call and talk to and you know he never was judging me or anything and he, he was always there to help give me guidance and you know it's just a, a great friend to have great coach and it's it's just been an, been an honor to have him on oh Davey boy you know I love you babe <laughs> And uh, yeah, definitely. I appreciate you coming on. You know, it was great meeting you. You know, anyone that Dave gives a stamp of approval to, I kind of question at first because it's Dave. But then I got to talk to you and, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and that's uh, a good you, philosophy to have. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was, uh, you know, it was great to have you on. I think you're a wealth of knowledge. Um, anyone that can last as a coach for 20 plus years in the high school level uh, is either doing something right or as something that the administrators don't want to know about. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> but um, no, obviously you're doing something right there over at uh, South Brunswick and they have a proud program over there, a good program. And it's cool to know that you're a big part of it. And again, we'd love to have you back on Um, again for anyone that's listening. He's uh, Wilfredo Rivera head coach for boys and girls cross country since 06 and head coach for boys spring track since 05 over at South Brunswick high schools over two plus decades of coaching experience. And, you know, it was great to have you on. I really appreciate it. Alex, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, it was great being here and, you know, I always love talking track. So I appreciate you guys for having me on. 100%. So yeah, anyone like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify and iTunes, spread the show word of mouth, find us on the socials at Talking Your Nobles. And coach, you can help us out with this. We haven't talked about this the last few weeks, but I'm bringing no. it back, Hyatt. Yes. Send us your PR. Get your athletes. If they have a PR... Or anyone that they know, you know, again, they're friends with everyone in the area. Tell them that there's this track show that wants to give them a shout out that can potentially reach millions of listeners because we're everywhere you can find a podcast. (laughs) Tell them there's a cool podcast. Uh, You know, the the athletes are welcome to come on with parental permission. We'd love to have them on. And, um, you know, send us the PR. We'll give them a shout out. We'll say what race they are in. We'll let the world know about what their work is, or even if it's a freaking great race and they feel really great about it. It doesn't have to be a PR necessarily, but this goes to your throwers, jumpers, anyone. They have a PR. Send it our way. Tell them to spread the word of mouth to anyone else that there's a show that's willing to shout their PRs out and really get them out there and let it be known because track is a grueling sport and we all feel the same pain in the end if we're given 100%. So everyone deserves that recognition. Excellent. Will do. Definitely. I'll let uh, let my guys and girls know. I'm sure they'll cool. love it. Cool. Cool. All right. So thank you everyone for listening uh, to Talking to Nobles. We will be back next week as always, uh, you know, and... We'll have a good time. We'll talk some more track. So again, everybody, thank you so much. So long, y'all.